Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, PSU Press Presents, uh, Politics, Power, and Philosophy, a discussion of three amazing new books from Penn State Press. I'm John Christman, a professor of philosophy and director of the Humanities Institute at, uh, at Penn State. We have with us um, Stuart Murray, author of The Living from the Dead, Disaffirming Biopolitics. Ted Miller, author of Friendly Sovereignty, Historical Perspectives on Carl Schmitt's Neglected Exception. And Eduardo Mendieta, co-editor with Amy Allen of Power, Neoliberalism, and the Reinvention of Politics, The Critical Theory of Wendy Brown. Um, I'm gonna ask each author to tell us a little bit about their book, and then we'll open it up for discussion, and they'll be taking your questions. Uh, you could submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, if your question is for a specific author, please you know, note that, and we'll do our best to get to as many, many questions as, as possible. So uh, let me introduce our panelists in a little more detail. Um, Stuart Murray, author of The Living from the Dead, Disaffirming Biopolitics, is professor of rhetoric and ethics in the Department of English Language and Literature at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. He holds affiliate appointments in the Department of Health Sciences and the Institute for Comparative Studies in Literature, Art, and Culture. Ted Miller is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Alabama. In addition to Friendly Sovereignty, Historical Perspectives on Carl Schmitt's Neglected Exception, he is the author of Mortal Gods, Science, Politics, and the Humanist Ambitions of Thomas Hobbes, also published by Penn State University Press. Eduardo Mendieta, is Professor of Philosophy and Latino Latino Studies and Affiliated fac Faculty at the School of International Affairs in the Bioethics Program at Pennsylvania State University, along with Amy Allen, who is Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Penn State. Eduardo is the editor of uh, the Penn State Series in Critical Theory, in which power, neoliberalism, and the reinvention of politics, the critical theory of Wendy Brown, is published. We'll now uh, begin uh, author presentations, and we begin with Stuart. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to thank my colleagues at Penn State University Press uh, for shepherding this, uh, this book over the last couple of years uh, to publication. Uh, it's a work of slow scholarship uh, that's taken some 10 years. Um, to my knowledge, it's the first book uh, that offers a rhetorical critique of biopolitics. And if biopolitics is uh, the politics of life itself, the meaning of life here isn't, uh, isn't self-evident. It's governed according to neoliberal, neoliberal efficiencies uh, through technologies and systems of surveillance, segregation, health and welfare regimes, pro uh, quote unquote life policies and improvement programs through education, statistical forecasts, securitization, risk management law, biomedicine and popular culture too. Uh, but perhaps I can start with my subtitle, Disaffirming Biopolitics. It is a claim that biopolitics itself ultimately disaffirms the very life that it purports to affirm. In other words, there's a sinister and seductive side uh, to biopolitics because the lives that it makes live uh, are ultimately connected to those it lets die. This is, in fact, uh, Michel Foucault's slogan for biopolitics. He says that it is the power to, quote, make live and let die, end quote. So for me, these two faces of biopolitics cannot quite be severed, the relation is hydraulic. Biopolitics kills, albeit indirectly and in the passive voice. It's a sacrificial economy. It's an exposure unto illness and death. It is the exploitation of differential vulnerabilities such as race, class, health status, and so on. We've seen this clearly throughout the pandemic, for example, where a certain number of deaths are deemed acceptable for the economy to prosper or uh, to protect a certain version of constitutional rights and liberties. 
We see the same thing in the ways that healthcare is and has been delivered or withheld and to whom. And it's the same thing again when we wage wars, whether they are military wars or culture wars. It's no secret. Um, I think everybody knows the dice are loaded. Everybody knows the game is rigged, if I can channel Leonard Cohen for a moment. Um, so there is, uh, there's a certain tolerance for, or indeed a certain, uh, we might say necessity for what we call collateral damages or negative externalities or opportunity costs, right? These are the acceptable ways of saying that my livingness depends on the poverty, the destitution, and sometimes the deaths of others. And these deaths, of course, are disavowed in a kind of biopolitical doublethink. So the book is about this particular agony, the living from the dead. This is a book in rhetorical and political theory grounded in a series of case studies. One case explores the notion of sacrifice in the so-called war against COVID-19, where I read the cultures of, of pandemic resistance alongside uh, provocatively, I think, alongside suicide terrorism and military suicides. I'm interested here in what it might mean to be suicided by society. Uh, uh, the, the phrase comes from the French philosopher Antonin Artaud. The pandemic, I think, is an object lesson in differential dying, affirmed by the state as much as by anti-mask, anti-lockdown, and anti-vax protesters. How then, I want to know, might we suspend our moral indignation to critically disaffirm biopolitics without quite capitulating to and recirculating its deadly tropes? Uh, for another case, another chapter addresses the California mass hunger strikes, uh, the prison hunger strikes in 2013, and the human right to die. Here, I was fascinated by the court order allowing the forced feeding of prisoners, inmates, residents, however they were called at the time, as if the state feared most that their death would at last lend them a living voice. Yet another chapter reads two cases, two legal cases of preventable uh, and so-called untimely childhood deaths, one of an indigenous child and the other a child of anti-vaxxers. Both refuse state biomedicine claiming to be sovereign citizens, but what kinds of sovereign rights should anti-vaxxers and indigenous peoples have respectively? How are they formulated, um, uh, especially in the face of state biomedical interventions? And finally, I take the case of a disabled black man whose death by drowning was video recorded by teenagers and posted to YouTube. This is a horrific example of how social media platforms remediate racist and biopolitical tropes. In the end, my choice of case studies was deeply personal. I found myself undone by them, and I hope I've honored the voices that spoke to me from their particular places of abandonment. But more than this, I think they enjoined me to critically reflect on and expose something of my own relation to them and their deaths and my relation to my writing and speaking on them, mindful, of course, of the inherent risks of appropriating them or exploiting them. This is a book then that is also about the, the ethics of rhetoric and composition. We talk almost ceaselessly about making live, about the sacredness of life, pricelessness and so forth. In response, my book turns to the disavowed underside of our biopolitical compact. It turns to biopolitical death and letting die. And it implores us to hearken our biopolitical dead, those we have let die in the name of life. To hearken uh, is an intransitive verb that does not take a direct object, not quite. To hearken, I must undertake instead to listen in care of death, 
Under what conditions then might we hearken those dead who summon us and exhort us perhaps to reckon with our own unspeakable complicity in their deaths? This isn't easy to do. Uh, I would of course uh, much rather flee uh, from these deaths uh, and flee from those I let die, not only because I would hope to disavow and uh, uncouple myself from this sacrificial exchange, its violence and its injustice, but also because I would hear in their voices, if I hearkened them, my own violence and death echoed there and the deaths of those I love and will have lost. This isn't easy to say or to write either because our language fails us. Ours is a language of life where the grammatical subject is sovereign. So instead, I wanted to conceive of a rhetorical agency that doesn't return us to the same old liberal individual uh, who's in pursuit of life and liberty. Compositionally, uh, I wanted my writerly form itself to be a means and a method of critique. So my style is sometimes lyrical and apostrophic. It purposely swerves in form from the normative and teleological assumptions of quote unquote logical content or closure. I wanted to frustrate my reader's desire for propositional content and to interrupt this kind of violence. And I wanted my form itself to occasion other voices, voices other than the one I call my own. My rhetoric of disaffirmation goes hand in hand then with an auto critique of my own writing in this book. Any purple passages are meant to resemble a bad bruise more than airy flights into gratuitous prose. Uh, these are sites of struggle in the stubborn effort to say, to write what in polite company remains unsaid. To join with the dead and to disaffirm biopolitics is a devastating undertaking. It's not self-righteously censorious. Um, in a certain humility, I think it would turn its gaze inward to, rec to recognize and reckon with my collusion and complicity in systems that let die in the name of my own livingness. And so from this author who speaks and writes from this I comes no roadmap, no manifesto, no closure. None could originate from a single human being and not least a white male scholar writing in lonely isolation from a tiny corner of our plagued planet. The eye loses any secure sense of self in these pages. Disaffirmation turns first on my own grievous fugitivity and my speech and writing become a mortifying auto critique of this subject. I who speaks here from the sad givenness of my own tenuous identities gifted by an accursed social order. In my words work, I tentatively reach toward a fragile we, and I do hope that my readers, if only for a moment here and there, will read my narrative I as their own. These subjects come undone, first person, singular, plural, as much as they stubbornly remain in the long moment of hearkening. And the project, our project, becomes one of holding and rendering remains. Thank you. Thank you very much for the beautiful uh, presentation. Um, before turning to Ted, I wanna remind people if any questions uh, occur to you uh, along the way uh, for any of our panel, panels, please put them in the Q&A and I'll get to them when we uh, turn to that. But, uh, section of our program. Uh, Ted, may I turn it over to you? Hello, and thank you for uh, having this, and thank you all for being here, and thanks again to uh, 
Penn State for uh, producing our books and for uh, holding this panel. So, Friendly Sovereignty, Historical Perspectives on Carl Schmitt's Neglected Exception, was written for fellow political theorists and historians of political thought, particularly those interested in concepts of sovereignty and for anyone interested in the way those who claim sovereignty use their power to pardon or extend extraordinary grace and favor to some subjects or citizens. This leads to a sustained, in my book, a sustained and comparative treatment of the French historian Jules Michelet, the 17th century British political philosopher Thomas Hobbes, and some of his near contemporaries like Leibniz, and of the ancient Stoic philosopher Seneca and his writings on mercy for the Emperor Nero. But before I can speak to the connecting points between these historical figures, I must speak first about Carl Schmidt and the way his thinking has so strongly influenced, and I think in many ways foreshortened, our understanding of sovereignty. He largely erases what I call sovereignty's friendly aspects. It was during the 20s, 1920s, in, and into Germany's Nazi period that Schmidt's fir Schmidt first became an influential political think and legal thinker. As the Weimar Republic teetered and eventually fell, he had announced that his liberal contemporaries were then, and indeed for some 100 years, hiding their heads in the sand when it came to concepts like sovereignty and the realm of life that we sometimes call the political. Schmidt captured the attention of many, including the fascists and proto-fascists of the right, but his influence has spread well uh, beyond that. And surely one of the reasons that, uh, for that widespread influence, even before the events of the 21st century, uh, the early 21st century, thrust his name to the top of the political theory marquee is this, that Schmidt articulated something that politically involved people of many persuasions had disliked about liberalism and the status quo that it seemed to have imposed upon so many. Many of a more radical stripe, regardless of which direction that radicalism took, found his critique of liberalism resonant. It seemed to him that the ideology had fostered a dominant worldview that favored a rejection of bellicose and they said and an irrational past and instead substituted a rational, technocratic, scientific, and an especially neutral approach to matters political. Even the most important decisions about the reigning order of the state were being reduced to calculations. Schmidt, uh, excuse me, liberals, Schmidt said, typically sought to shelter themselves from such hard choices by seeking neutral and objective criteria even where life and circumstances really demanded that they make choices on the basis of convictions and allegiances specific to their populations and their sense of who and what their state was meant to be. But since those were hard, contentious political questions, they tended to avoid them as much as they could and remain in the comfortable slumber of persons convinced that rationality and scientific advances in governance would ride to their rescue, or at least stand as legitimating cover for the political decisions they had rather not admit that they had made. What could awaken liberals from this slumber? Crisis, said Schmidt, could do it. Only when the state was in peril, or in moments when the entire constitutional order itself was up for fundamental examination, could one determine the difference between mere legality on the one hand and the basis for legitimacy on the other. States had to offer members a basis for their allegiance. And if they were unaware of it in times of tranquility and the regular drowsy administration of established rules and laws, crisis could make them see the necessity for choices they had hoped not to face. Antagonism and hostility, this World War I veteran, were clarified. And so too with sovereignty concepts, said Schmidt. Liberal thinkers had a substance less idea of what the sovereign was all too often. For them, 
the sovereign was merely the peak of an administrative state apparatus, the highest authority. They did not ask in this connection if the laws and rules administered by the sovereign were themselves subject to being suspended, or if there were higher existential matters at stake. They did not adequately contemplate the ways in which the sovereign was himself not subject to laws that he kept for everyone else, but a crisis, said Schmidt, an emergency when the state and its members were in peril could compel liberals to face these questions. Peace, tranquility, and the regular administration of law, said Schmidt, ultimately therefore hid the deep truth about sovereignty. Liberals were inclined towards the legal ideals that created a state that was machine-like and mechanical in its neutral administration of law. The crisis, however, revealed that the sovereign had sometimes to play a role that was quite different. It was not merely the great machine state's superintendent. Individuals in those executive offices, if they were truly persons in possession of sovereign power, decided upon legal exceptions. They could suspend the laws and rules to meet the emergency and very often involve the deployment of the state's most violent and hostile forces against domestic enemies. Sovereigns could declare the exception that said that the legal protections a state might normally afford its members could be lifted in order that the state might survive a threat to its very existence. We need only think of America's early 21st century war on terror to know that Schmidt's counsel on the extra legal harm sovereigns could do were going to be brought back to everyone's attention as indeed, of course, they were. But for Schmidt, who like many future fascists were anxious to emphasize the threat of Bolshevism, he didn't just rely on the urgency of Weimar's evident instability, not in Schmidt's argument. He also, and here I'll get to the substance of the book, he also cast his gaze back in, in, backwards and said that he wasn't merely investing, inventing, excuse me, new concepts of sovereignty in politics but actually recovering the concepts that had been known before the liberal worldview, he said, had obliterated their memory. Early moderns and even enlightenment thinkers knew what he knew about sovereignty and politics. Thomas Hobbes in particular, Schmidt said, was the real discoverer of Schmidt's own preferred decisionist approach to understanding sovereignty and politics. It was the 19th century liberals and their early 20th century, his early 20th century contemporary who had put people to sleep. But as a Hobbes scholar and as a student of 17th century politics, I knew that Schmidt's emphasis on sovereign extra legal power and exceptions may be able to show us some important weaknesses and some particularly technocratic liberal political conceptions, but that it was also eclipsing much else. He was erasing what early modern thinkers knew about sovereignty, and even what some 19th century European liberal thinkers knew. Finally, there was a missing contribution from what some ancient thinkers had to say about sovereignty, the law, and the capacity to kill outside the law, so important for Schmidt. And that's why I wrote Friendly Sovereignty, to fill those gaps so that we could reacquaint ourselves with what the Schmidtian perspectives tend to erase. The sovereign's extra legal powers, for those who knew them well, always had in previous centuries and even into the 19th century, what I call a friendly side. Sometimes that side was celebrated as the king and emperors tempered justice with mercy or granted mass pardons to celebrate major events like the opening of parliament or royal, the royal weddings of their children. Sometimes those powers were detested as sovereigns extended legal immunity to friends and allies, even when the state's laws demanded persecution, as when, for example, the Stuart kings ran afoul of their Protestant subjects for not persecuting Catholics, not least their Catholic queens and her circle at court. Legal exceptions for the sake of granting patents and monopolies could generate revolutionary howls from dissenting subjects. Here, the exception causes the crisis rather than the other way around. And in some cases, friendly exceptions for those of the king's, those in the king's special grace and favor 
were the source of longstanding historical resentments. Friendly sovereignty works down a reverse chronology starting in the 19th century with Bichelet, who, aside from standing in strong contrast to Schmidt's picture of a typical 19th century liberal, is by far the most antagonistic towards the friendly aspects of sovereigns, be they monarchical or democratic. Next is Schmidt's sometimes hero, Hobbes, with some long comparative reflections on Leibniz. Not only do I show readers where Schmidt misreads Hobbes as a decisionist, but I also show that Hobbes, even as an absolutist who insisted his sovereign was above the laws, was actually quite ambivalent about friendly exceptions and worried about the effects monopolies and other forms of legal get out of jail free cards uh, would have. He feared the way that they could harm the peace and stability of the state. Hobbes was particularly concerned when sovereigns permitted uh, illegal impunity uh, to the great. That was Hobbes's way of referring to subjects who exercised outsized influence due to their wealth and station. Finally, the book turns towards Seneca, who wrote De Clementia to sell Nero on the virtues and advantages of using his extra-legal power as de facto king to withhold punishments. What made him sovereign was not that he could kill outside the law, said Seneca. For many royal palace residents close to the emperor, had for years already proven their hand and their ability to kill outside the law. What distinguished him, said Seneca to Nero, above all others, was that he could spare a life contrary to law. It was a great way to get a future tyrant to hold back and counterbalance some of his most, most lethal inclinations while it lasted. In Friendly Sovereignty, I questioned those who today celebrate Seneca's praise of mercy they recommend it to leaders. But is it really a lesson we want for leaders of free peoples? With the Trump administration now just past us, it's fair to say that history is caught up to my project. And the book closes by reminding us how dangerous a sovereign can be when we allow them the extraordinary power to pardon, forgive, suspend the law, or make friendly extra legal accommodations for allies, donors, supporters, or indeed co-conspirators. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Then <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, Eduardo, would you like to uh, begin? Yeah. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you, colleagues, uh, Stuart and Ted, for those amazing summaries, overviews of your work. Um, and, and thank you to um, Kate and Janice for hosting them and Penn State University Press. Um, this is wonderful. So my book is actually very different from my colleagues um, and yet very similar. It's different in that um, it's an anthology. It's a, it's a collection of essays um, that deal with the work of Wendy Brown, one of the foremost I think political philosophers, um, and and we have a, a series of um, superlative contributions. But before I get into the book, let me just mention that um, this is the fourth volume in a series. Um, is the Penn State series in critical theory? The first volume was on Rahel Yegi. Uh, the second volume was on Reiner Forst. The third volume was on Enrique Dussel. And this is the most recent volume. Um, Amy and I have been collaborating on these uh, volumes over, over a couple of years, six years. Um, there was to be a volume on Achille and Bembe. Um, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, the symposium never materialized. Um, and, and so we had to put that on hold. <coughs> um, but looking forward, we are going to be doing um, a symposium in the spring of 2023 on the work of Patricia Hill Collins, one of the pioneering black feminists or Afro-American feminists in the United States. <coughs> 
So this is part of a series and it has a structure. There's, there's a format. And the format is that we begin with a keynote by the subject of the symposium. And um, the keynote is supposed to be the most recent work that they're working on. And then we get six, seven people commenting on the work. And hopefully we get both a, a longitudinal and in-depth analysis. And then the, 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 the books end with the subject of the symposia book uh, responding to the people who have written on them. So it's bookended by what I'm thinking now and how do I respond by your observations, assessments, and so on and so forth. It's supposed to be dialogic. Um, in this case, the book that we're talking about, um, Power Neoliberalism and the Reinvention of Politics, the subject is obviously Wendy Brown and Wendy Brown begins with an amazing lecture of what is left of freedom. And, and, and then we have a series of um, people talking about different aspects of her work. Her feminism, her take on feminism, which is very critical, generative, um, her take on Foucault, which is, I think, one of the most interesting readers of Foucault. And interestingly enough, questions of sovereignty and questions of biopolitics. We have people dealing with um, her conception of history. Um, we have people dealing with, in my case, I contribute an essay to the volume on the title of my uh, contribution is called Voluntary Subordination. And uh, I'm particularly um, interested in um, Wendy Brown's analysis of what she calls the um, femina domestica, um, the role of gender under neoliberalism. Um, we have someone looking at questions of temporality in, in Wendy Brown's work. And then um, we have uh, Robin Selicates uh, looking at questions of depolitization, hyperpolitization, uh, hyper pseudopolitization. Um, and, then, and then the book ends um, with Wendy Brown's engagement with these um, observations. And um, I have to say that uh, Wendy Brown's um, response is really fascinating because she wasn't like, I'm gonna defend my position. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in thinking together. And that's, that's what she called her epilogue, thinking together. So what, what, what you said, meaning the contributors um, evoking me wasn't so much that I need to defend a position because I'm interested in creating theoretical tools. Um, so um, that's more or less the, the structure of the text. Um, I have to say that, um, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, Amy Allen, my co-editor is not here. Um, because we together wrote, I think, uh, a, a quite important introduction to the text, um, which gives a really uh, synoptic but in-depth analysis of Wendy Brown's um, theoretical development. Um, I mean, I have here a pile of books that I went and got out of my library. Um, um, which, you know, they, they've been really important um, works in political philosophy, feminist theory, um, the critique of neoliberalism, the coming to terms with the fading of nation states 
in the age of globalization and the rise of movements to create walls. And most importantly, the rise of authoritarian conceptions of freedom. Um, so this, this text is um, both historical, but it gives us really interesting insights into how it is that we um, got ourselves into where we are with white freedom, authoritarian freedom, what Wendy Brown calls in other places, um, Frankenstein freedom. Um, and, and so we, we think that this is um, a really important contribution to the understanding of critical theory. Um, I should note that um, critical theory is both a metonym, but also a signifier of a certain kind of tradition, which um, next year will celebrate a hundred years. And it goes back to the founding of the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt, um, which then launched an interdisciplinary project of the critique of contemporary society using psychoanalysis, sociology, um, political theory, cultural critique. Um, so critical theory, i.e. Frankfurt critical theory, as it was um, established with the founding of the Institute for Social Research, um, launched um, a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary collaborative project that sought to bring all of these disciplines in order to understand at the time the rise of, of authoritarian cultures, the convergence of mass culture with authoritarian cultures, the transformation of the psyche in an age of mass culture, um, and obviously uh, the political economy of the new system and how that had um, effects on these other things, the psyche, uh, social psychology, and the way we related to authoritarian personalities. Um, so um, just to come to a close to overview this, this volume, which is very different from my colleagues, yet um, in the same region, in the same constellation, so to say, um, it's an anthology that um, grapples with the very intense, generative, um, forward-looking aspects of Wendy Brown's um, thinking uh, that intersects several areas, political philosophy, feminism, conceptions of freedom, i.e. philosophy in general. Um, and obviously the crisis of neoliberalism and how neoliberalism, neoliberalism has undermined um, democratic ethos um, and, and so on. So um, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to your questions and maybe having a dialogue with my colleagues. Um, particularly, I, I have studied Schmidt for a long time. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm delighted that this work on this and obviously biopolitics as someone who has studied Foucault, my contribution in this volume is about Wendy Brown's reading of the biopolitical and neoliberalism as a form of, new, uh, of biopolitics that has its own very interesting um, effects. But I'll stop right there. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Um, um, I invite people again to uh, type your questions in the Q&A um, window, which I can see. Um, and before getting to them, uh, do you all, do our panelists 
have any additional uh, questions or comments on each other's work? Eduardo just mentioned the commonalities among you. I can see a variety of overlapping uh, threads, um, especially having to do with power and uh, critiques of the liberal ethos and the liberal state. Um, but does anyone have any questions of each other? Stuart, please. Well, I, I, I thank you, Ed, Eduardo and, and Ted. Uh, I'm interested in, I would, I'm interested in a conversation between the two of you thinking about how biopolitics and neoliberalism squares with uh, sovereignty, right? And uh, in this, and we can't, I can't, I can't mention sovereignty uh, on a day like today without talking about <laughs> the death of Queen Elizabeth II yesterday, right? The end of the sovereign. Uh, and, you know, whether she was a friendly <laughs> sovereign or um, whether she was a function of increasingly neoliberal and mediatized, I mean, just turn on the TV and it, it's, it's astounding, right? The news feeds and so forth. Um, it seems that all decisionism that that's the, that we would ascribe to the sovereign uh, are, are subject to a kind of popular sovereignty or a, a kind of neoliberalism, a diffuse kind of power that uh, has no sort of sovereign um, uh, focus or 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 locus. Well, I, that sort of sounds like it's for me. Thank you, Stuart. Um, um, of course, it's difficult to really sort of fully formulate my thoughts now that you know death is very recent. But I, I do, I do think that you know when one looks at um, the way in which the British monarchy has functioned as uh, sometimes a figurehead sovereign, uh, some of the friendly aspects still shine through. Um, and I should add, it's not really a question of a friendly sovereign or other. There's always, my, my, my claim is that there are really an ocean of different aspects of sovereignty, where we want, you know, we think of the unlimitedness that we associate with sovereignty it can extend in many directions. And that Schmidt has guided us towards those that are, are most hostile, um, especially when they're extra legal. And, and I'm not trying to uh, discount that perspective uh, when it drives us towards urgent, let's say, corrections of some of that lethality. I'm in sympathy with that. Um, but I do say that, it, the, that the emphasis on lethality and hostility can blind us sometimes to these other aspects of sovereignty. So for example, I can't remember the name. I know that the queen would, on uh, every, day of one particular day of the year would would distribute special coins to her subjects and in the the curtain uh the current uh remembrance of queen elizabeth everyone would speak of her her particular kindness to subjects and that, you know that she you know you were the only one in the room with her and that this has always been an aspect right of uh what it is to be sovereign uh, and it is one of the things that uh, historically speaking, right, that people have loved about their sovereigns. And one of the questions I wanna raise, and it, it's certainly, you know, I'm using the F word freedom, which is obviously another very loaded, uh, another loaded term here. But, the, but one of the questions, a, a more classic question is, is, is whether that kind of admiration for those who do us these, this favor, who extend us that kind of grace, is really consistent with um, the form of rule that we would like free people, what's left of freedom, yeah, uh, yeah. To, to exercise. Uh, and uh, I come down on the side that it that it's not, uh, and that sometimes we we've, we've admired too much the some of the friendly exceptions. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that's what uh, well, what my previous remarks about our last president apropos there, but. Uh, uh, I didn't quite touch on neoliberalism quite so much, but I can I can circle back. Thank you, Doctor. <laughs>
That's, that's, that's awesome. Thank you, Ted. Um, one of the aspects of our book is that um, we've highlighted or foregrounded um, Wendy Brown's contribution to what we can call a genealogy of freedom, a history of freedom. People say, I want to be free. Um, what, what, what does that mean? And, and so what uh, Wendy Brown has done over, I don't know, 30, 40 years is really to get into the genealogy of freedom, how we produce different imaginaries of freedom and, and how we create institutions to embody those imaginaries of freedom. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, and I'm really glad um, about your, your, what you just said, um, Ted. Um, so um, I, I don't wanna to take too much time, but I just wanna make a point that um, I think, um, um, unfortunately, um, we have to go back to Carl Schmitt and in particular his constitutional theory uh, text where um, he is advocating for something like executive uh, supremacy. And in fact, he's known as the juries of the Third Reich. Um, and in particular, because he asked, he said that the Fuhrer was the protector of the constitution. And, and I think that those arguments uh, reductio ad absurdum are really relevant through what we're going through. So that I just wanted to make that comment that Schmidt, unbeknownst to him, has become relevant to us in our own constitutional crisis because we're going through these debates. And, and um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that. Now, Stuart's uh, text, and, and thank you for that beautiful presentation. Um, so I would want to ask you, um, you know, yes, this affirm biopolitics, um, but on the, on the other hand, under neoliberalism, um, there is a new form of biopolitics. As a matter of fact, I'm going to teach you in the spring in a seminar that I'm teaching, a graduate seminar called Biopolitics, Necropolitics, and Digital Blackness. And, and so what happens to biopolitics in the age of mass media, of social media? And I, as you know, um, Foucault said that under a biopolitical regime, um, the way to assert racism is to say, the, the, the sovereign reasserts its right to kill by saying these people are a threat to the bios, right? And, and so, but how does that happen in under neoliberalism in this new, let's say, let's call it digital regime or algor algorithmic um, sovereignty? That's a fantastic question. Um, uh, to me, any vestige of sovereignty, uh, there's not much left in a, in a digital regime. Uh, it's, it's sovereignty becomes a ruse uh, of power. Uh, it becomes a ruse of uh, a kind of hyper, hyper individualism as well, where we arrogate to ourselves the kind of sovereign citizenship and we see this in our culture wars and so forth. Um, and, you know, in terms of decisionism, I think that sort of rational choice is also that this, this, it's an illusion that we have a kind of, uh, you know, just thinking about the, the, the pandemic, for instance, we've gone, we've done a complete 180 from taking care of others, uh, we're all in this together, these kinds of slogans to now, you do you. Uh, and uh, I'm meant to, I'm, I'm in fact, I'm told I must support and respect, these are the words from my administration, my students' personal choices, as if these 
as if these moral codes were absolutely interchangeable. This is the rent point about the end of World War II as well, right? What's horrifying to her is that the German people could, could just exchange one moral code for another overnight, right? So for me, <laughs> that's horrifying uh, because it's about a certain unthinkingness, as a rent would say, right? And we need yeah. to go back to philosophy. But um, I, there's, I would say there's very little by way of decisionism that's not the illusion of a decision in our mediated culture, right? In the way that right. Queen Elizabeth is an algorithmic function, she's a meme. Um, and, you know, <laughs> she's been memeified for so long that, you know, her death never took place. That we, can, we can have a kind of Baudrillardian <laughs> moment, right? Um, or it's always taken place. So, um, and so the problem is, what do, how do we, how do we deal with this when our language itself is sort of stuck to a kind of old political liberalism and so forth? This is what this is the kind of work that Wendy Brown has been thinking about for a long time, right? How do we? Um, She's not a rhetorician, so she doesn't quite sort of arrive at that angle. She she approaches from a politi as a political theorist, but um, I think there are ways for us to think differently, to represent differently, uh, to interrupt the kinds of neoliberal regimes that we have. And of course, she's critical of the left as well, because you know we're at we're in a war, and we arrive. I mean, this is a bit cynical, but. We arrive, uh, we, you know, good, us good liberals, lefties, we arrive, you know, with vegan, uh, organic baked goods to a war rather than, or we get on our social media and we bemoan and we love our kind of moral outrage and so forth. Um, I call this the alt left. Um, you know, we've, we've, over the last 20 years, we've taken on this kind of, the, the kind of moral code of, of the right and how it, the right has been, the alt-right has manipulated our media and turned us all into sort of memes, but stop yeah. rambling. This is really interesting. Um, let me throw in a question we got um, that I think fits well with a lot of, some of what you all were saying. Uh, ben Randolph asked everyone, um, how do you all foresee the likelihood of ongoing pandemics affecting the legitimacy or effectiveness of the rule of law? What new or renewed dangers of sovereign exceptional, exceptionality should we anticipate? I think it's an interesting focus on sort of the ongoing crisis or sense of crisis that pandemics present and future introduce, exacerbating the dynamics that you all are not diagnosing. Well, let me, let me uh, just very briefly, um, and, and I think that Ted should jump on this. Um, I think the pandemic has um, given us an X-ray of, an X-ray of a biopolitical regime. Um, and, and here are two cases. On the one hand that um, Trump tried to utilize the pandemic as a political tool. So he used the virus and the production of the vaccines as a biopolitical tool. Um, saying, well, if they're gonna die, let them die. Literally, I mean, he said that. On the other hand, he also defunded the uh, World Health Organization because he would not, they would not do what he wanted them to do. He also, um, use the distribution of the vaccine along political lines. So this is like the most blatant example of um, biopolitics. On the other hand, we have learned to what an extent we live under a biopolitical regime. Native Americans are the most uh, affected. Their mortality is over the roof. Then you have African Americans, then you have Hispanics, then you have whites, and then you have Asians. This is all statistically demonstrated. And these numbers just tells us 
who, who, who can live and who's led to die. So I, I, I think that's a, a Ben's question is fantastic. Um, anyway. Yeah, and oh, go ahead, Ted, please. Oh, well, actually, I, I, in, in many respects, Eduardo mentioned me, but I think the, the letting die part might be better for Stuart. Uh, uh, but um, it's a tough question. I think if I, if I could uh, rephrase it or, or repeat it, it was the question of what is the, what do future pandemics uh, mean for the rule of law and sovereign action? And um, in, in many ways, I think that we, we've gotten some, you know, as Eduardo rightly points out, some, some rather aggressive uh, biopolitical actions on the parts of, of some of our leaders, Trump mainly. Um, in other respects, we've seen some real stumbling, and maybe Stuart can speak more to this because he's, he's, he's been uh, more immersed in it than I have. But when one thinks of the CDC in the United States, and it's it's sort of um, now, you know, sort of confessed that it, it, it's, it's not really sure how to speak with an authoritative voice about right. what should be done in the face of a pandemic. Uh, uh, once upon a time in my very distant past, I, I, I sort of advised a few folks on health sciences matters. And, you know, the folks who engage in uh, uh, public health are you know, and they will remind you that sometimes, you know, you have to engage in extra legal activities such as quarantines. And there was a, a sort of a strong tradition of, well, the medical expert will suddenly gain a great deal of power that he wouldn't normally have. And one of the things that strikes me about recent history with the CDC is that that is, that is eroded. Uh, and we might say, you know, perhaps if we have a certain kind of Foucauldian perspective, that erosion has been a good thing. Uh, I'm not so sure that it's been a good thing, um, uh, in part because, as Eduardo noted, that we have allowed many to let die, uh, and uh, so I'm not I'm not positive exactly how to uh, finally answer that question, uh, but it is it is definitely quite a relevant question, uh, and uh, I appreciate. It. That, that's probably as far as I could go in answering. Thank you. I, I wonder if we could invite Stuart to weigh in since this deals so much with the, what your work and Eduardo too. As we're going, I, I want to note we're going about three minutes, four minutes over time because this is so interesting. But I want to just alert the audience that we'll we'll wrap things up in, in three three or four minutes. Um, yeah, thanks. I think uh, this is really fascinating. The question is great. <laughs> what about future pandemics or future waves or variants and so forth? Um, I think if we want to look to where things are going, um, you know, uh, and to understand Trumpism and its, you know, its future, um, we, you know, we might look at Steve Bannon and what he was doing during the pandemic. He ran a successful YouTube channel, had his own media outlets. Uh, he was one of the first ones on the right to take the pandemic actually very seriously. He, um, his channel was called War Room Pandemic. Of course, after following the War Room Impeachment 1 and Impeachment 2 and so forth. But then, this was the War Room about the pandemic. And of course, he took it seriously. Um, uh, talked about the, the Wuhan virus. This is where Trump was getting a lot of its rhetoric, but, um, uh, but his target, of course, is not, was, is not the Chinese people. Uh, we're supposed to, he says, we're supposed to bond with the Chinese people and try to liberate them from their oppressors, the Communist Party of China and so forth. So he's calling for a kind of, he's calling for a, a return to traditionalism, the make America great again, uh, sort of um, uh, ethos, right? He's calling for a return to traditionalism <laughs> and calling on American freedom fighters, uh, as he calls them, which should be terrifying to us, um, but calling on us each and all to take up arms in the new war. So I think we're going to see what we see now, a kind of populism and a kind of culture war and a kind of clash between cultures and the state, a struggling state. Just think back to the 
think back as well to Black Lives Matter protests post uh, George Floyd's murder, right? The ways that the state became extra legal and, and so forth, but in a biopolitical sense, right? So I think we'll see more of this kind of populism and more boogaloo boys and, and radicalized libertarians and, and clashes on the streets and random acts of violence, which we, I, 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 and it would make us long for the return of the sovereign to save us from our worst selves, but you know, it, it's yeah. too late. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, on, <laughs> on that on that note, uh, anytime we we would uh, end or did interrupt this rich discussion would be arbitrary and, and unfortunate, and it's true in this case too. Um, please um, let me thank our wonderful authors, um, both for their volumes and their discussions here. And uh, thanks to the audience. Um, this um, session was recorded and that can be accessed later. Um, and so I'd like to bring the session to a close. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>